Welcome to The Honest Channel. I'm Claire Johnston, a journalist on a mission to understand how to age well, look and feel good for longer and share what I learn with you. And what looking good for longer actually means will vary from person to person. For some, it can mean simply protecting our skin from sun damage and keeping it looking healthy and glowing. For others, it can also mean taking things a step further and seeking out clinical treatments and procedures to keep skin volumized and tight into our later years. One thing's for sure, no matter which route we take, we all wanna stay safe and healthy. And there've been quite a few scary headlines over the past six months around filler treatments in particular, and whether they could pose health risks. So today I've asked two of my favourite aesthetic specialists, Dr Chen Shu and Dr Emmeline Ashley, back onto the channel to discuss both the older types of filler like hyaluronic acid, along with fairly newer treatments including biostimulators like Sculptra and Radius, polynucleotide injectables, microtox and more. So we're going to get a safety assessment here today so that we can hopefully feel better informed and more confident about the choices we make when it comes to skin aesthetics. It's good to see you both again. And um, thanks as always for being here because it, it's been a while because you've both been settling into some big career moves recently. Dr. Emmeline, you're still out in the Cayman Islands. How's it going there? It's going really well. I'm enjoying it. It's definitely a little um, change of scenery after being in Edinburgh. So a bit more sunshine. <laughs> um, you know, really nice golden beaches. I'm, I'm very spoiled for the weather, but I was complaining to my husband yesterday that I've not seen rain in ages and there's not oh. been any like, gray, cloudy skies. Why don't you come back for a week and we can really easily fix that? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, Dr. Chen, you've taken on an exciting new role since we last saw you. Tell us about it. Yeah, I have. Actually, the last recording that we did, I had just started and um, I didn't want to mention it too much. So I'm now the medical director of a new private clinic in central London. Um, it's a really big clinic. Quite, It's a little hidden gem, I'd say, well, big hidden gem. Um, but it, it's uh, not just about aesthetics, it's actually an uh, integrated medical wellness and aesthetics clinic. And I'm heading that up and, and building it up. So that's really exciting. Oh, you are the perfect person for that job. Congratulations. And I mean, I look to you two as doctors, both with enormous integrity as well as experience, not just in aesthetics, as you were saying there, Chen, but um, you've both worked for years in emergency care settings too. So you do bring that depth of general medical knowledge too. I wanted to return today to an issue of health safety, actually, because we're discussing the safety of filler and hyaluronic acid filler in particular, and some of the other injectable options that are now on the market and how they compare. We're starting with hyaluronic acid filler because in recent months there has been some discussion in the media and picked up by some higher profile doctors on YouTube and social media more widely about a warning that was sounded by a team of doctors in the US, as I understand it, that there is evidence that hyaluronic acid filler causes some degree of lymphatic blockage. So blockage of the lymph nodes, which play an important um, part in our immune system because they help the body identify and get rid of toxins and cancer cells. And we've had a bit of a leap from A to Z on that. So some scary headlines around the risks. And I know I've been asked about it on my channel and there's a bit of concern out there, understandably. So I'm going to start with you, Dr. Emmeline, because I know you've been looking at the evidence on this and you can help put it in context for us. How concerned should we be about reports that hyaluronic acid filler can block lymph nodes and negatively affect the immune system? Well, so like anything in medicine or science, you know, these conversations do require a little bit of nuance and a little bit of context and a bit of reading around the topic. Um, and you did mention before that there were some quite high profile kind of social media um, clinician personalities um, who had reposted this and they got a lot of pushback from other clinicians because it was felt that that was slightly irresponsible because the way that this was framed and the headlines were quite alarming and very click baby um, and a little bit misleading. And, and yes, I would have been kind of irresponsible. So this whole idea that ooh, could filler lead to cancer. I mean, that is potentially 
quite frightening and very scary for a lot of people, yeah. particularly if they have had filler. Of course, that would be um, quite scary. Um, and I do think, you know, online in general, there's always there's such a trend and issue with science misinformation and also a lack of interest in actually critically appraising evidence or looking at the new nuance, because what's going to get you clicks and likes is, you know, a big scary headline like that. Um, so I was trying to just have a look at exactly what the study said, what the research was. From what I could find, the research was an abstract that was presented at the annual scientific conference of the British Association of Aesthetic Plastic Surgeons. And it was purely looking at excessive filler and stating that excessive filler has the potential to block lymphatic systems. And that's really crucial there, isn't it? When you said excessive filler. So is that people with overfilled faces, basically? Exactly. Okay. In, in fact, the title of the presentation was the use of lymphocytography in the diagnosis of overfilled faces. Okay. So, um, and the actual paper, I couldn't find the actual paper anywhere because I don't think it has actually been studied or peer reviewed yet. I'm not saying it's not a great piece of research, but you know, it's very hard to get anything else from that. So looking specifically at how, again, overfilled faces may lead to lymphatic blockage is a world away from linking the safe use of appropriately placed filler by a medical professional to cancer. Um, and I think any clinician would say quite happily, you know, anyone who's ever had filler or administered, or administered filler does understand that there is a potential side effect of swelling and it's usually temporary. Um, if persisting, you know, filler usually can be dissolved or there are management plans in place for that. Um, the president of the British um, Association of Aesthetic Plastic Surgeons came out and said, people don't need to panic and have fillers dissolved. This is preliminary research that gives an explanation for the side effects that we know about with fillers. Um, and another consultant dermatologist came out to the press and said, you know, there's zero scientific foundation that fillers are directly impacting the immune system leading to increased cancer risk. So it was a sensational headline and of course it got attention. Um, but you know, these types of things, I, I do struggle with them because I think they can be a little bit irresponsible when they're spread without having that conversation around it um, because it does scare people and it is quite frightening. Yeah, and I, I mean, just from some of the comments I got, I actually had people say, well, these fillers cause cancer. And people see the headlines, they hear the words in the same sentence, and that's the connection that they make, unless it's broken by putting it in context like this. Um, so hopefully that clears it up for a lot of people. Dr. Chen, the team of doctors who first discussed their, their concerns flagged that under eye filler was particularly hazardous. So how do lymph nodes get blocked? And have you seen evidence of this in clinical practice? Is this a common thing? So generally under eye filler or tear trough filler is a lot more risky compared to some other areas um, because that area around the eyes um, is, is highly vascular. There are nerves there um, that are more prone to damage. So with lymphatic um, blockage, it can either be caused by potentially, theoretically, um, I mean, I, it, I don't think filler, it, because it's such a large molecule, I don't think it, it can actually get into the lymphatic system as such. It's not like injecting directly into um, an artery or a vein, for example, because those are larger vessels. Mm -hmm. um, but usually it would be from... Um, large amounts of filler around the lymphatic system and causing compression from outside okay. um, and potentially leading to blockage that way, which, um, you know, goes back to what Dr. Emmeline said about these studies talking about overfilled faces. So when you have too much filler in one area, there's a lot of pressure within the tissues and that then compresses on everything in that area, not just lymphatic system, but also um, veins, arteries in those areas. So theoretically, you know, that can, that can cause vascular occlusions in areas where the blood vessels are, are compressed. And vascular occlusion is that compression of the blood vessels, so that might actually block the blood vessel, is that? So a vascular occlusion is um, any anything that blocks the flow of blood in a blood vessel. So either that's blockage from inside or it's external compression blocking okay. the blood vessel. 
people that way. So, you know, in practice, um, under eye filler is done quite a lot by a whole range of different people. Um, and I will just say this, because it's highly risky, we need to carefully select our patients, whether this is suitable for them or not. For some people, they have the treatment, it actually makes things a lot worse. Um, I am extremely picky about who I would do this treatment for. Um, and the technique used to treat this area also is very important. Mm. Um, and also, you know, how, how careful someone is, because theoretically, we can ca also cause damage to the lim um, lymph vessels by actually doing the injection itself. Um, yeah. And any damage to the, the lymphatic system can then lead to blockage potentially as well. Um, so it is a, a lot, it's more common for that area to become more swollen um, after the treatment. And for some people that can persist, which is then very difficult to reverse. Um, so in practice, the patients that I choose to treat, I've not seen a problem in those patients um, treating that area, but I have seen people who have had these treatments done elsewhere before. And then they tell me about the problems that they've had. And I see, you know, puffiness, worsening of their eye bags um so that's what really why we have to be careful some people are going to be watching this and thinking am i overfilled you know they might have had quite a lot of hyaluronic acid filler put into their face and think i think it looks okay but i mean how can we define for people what excessive um use or overfilled looks like dr emeline why don't i throw that one to you <laughs> I think, you know, I think that is quite, it's a difficult question to answer. I think that's why you have to really trust the clinician you're going to. I mean, to me, the, the easy thing to say would to say if something's distorting the natural anatomy, it's not respecting the natural anatomy or the aging process or understanding the aging, aging process, um, then yes, we're at risk of overfilling. But that's why I think choosing your clinician is so, so important. You have to have that trust and you have to go to someone that is able to say no to you. And I think that's one of the most important things that as um, a clinician, it's our responsibility to be able to do is to say no to people when we know something's inappropriate. And like Dr. Chen was saying, not every treatment is correct for every patient. So someone can come to you saying, I would really like some tear trough filler, but if it's not appropriate for them, you have to be able to say no. Um, so yeah, it's there's not an easy, quick answer, um, but I think it just goes back to having that really strong relationship with the clinician that you trust. And Dr. Chen, are you still happy to work with hyaluronic acid filler rather um, on a day-to-day a -day basis and recommend it to clients? So the short answer is yes. Um, I, For me, is one of the tools I have. I think the actual products themselves, the, the ones that I use, I believe they are safe. They've been around for long enough. Um, the key really is is it an appropriate treatment for a particular patient? Um, that that's that's a key. It's not a, a case of you know whether whether the product itse itself is safe or not. You can have a very safe product if not injected correctly, can cause a lot of problems. Um, so I believe hyaluronic acid is safe to use, but we just have to use it correctly, um, using the right techniques and using the right amounts in the right person. The slight wobble that I've had around this is that it makes you think can injecting chemicals into our faces ever truly be considered safe? We're doing something that, you know, the body's not necessarily set up for. Um, I mean, again, Dr. Chen, what do you think about that? Um, with every medical procedure, whether we are injecting something, taking something out, even, even taking blood, for example, every single medical procedure that's invasive does carry a risk. So, um, it's always about balancing the risk and the benefit. So if doing a particular treatment brings a much greater benefit to the potential risks, then it's worth doing, right? So that is something that is, is a very individual, um, it's a personal question. It's a very individualized. So you can't, you know, blank it and say, this is right or this is wrong. Um, it depends on what kind of, what level of risk someone is able to accept and also as a clinician, what sort of risk I'm um, willing to take and what kind of results I think I can um, produce for someone um, and you know how big a difference it's going to make. So there are lots of factors here involved. I definitely wouldn't be offering a treatment that I believe is risky or dangerous 
So if if it's too risky, it will be absolute no for me. Even if someone asked me to do something, I will be like, no, I'm not doing that. Mm-hmm. But if the risk is relative and there are steps that we can take to reduce that risk, then it's then it's a maybe. So it depends. Then it's a conversation then between me and the patient. Dr. Emmeline, is is that your take as well? Yeah, I really agree with that. You know, um, hyaluronic acid fillers, they're as safe as any minimally invasive medical procedure can be. Um, The whole process of getting FDA approval um, is really, really meticulous and very thorough. So these FDA approved fillers that I would use in my practice, you know, they need to go through preclinical testing, rounds and rounds of clinical trials. And then we've literally got decades of post-market surveillance to ensure ongoing safety um, and efficacy. Um, And I do agree it's an individual choice. So what risks are acceptable to one person might be different for someone else. Um, I think the best way that I can often answer the question for patients, if they're, you know, if they're not completely sure, and if they want to know my opinion, I'm very comfortable and happy to have these treatments myself. I would be comfortable and happy for my mom or my sister or my husband if he was interested to have these treatments. Um, So when I'm trying to advise patients, you know, I tell them I'm advising you, I'm giving the exact same advice that I would give a loved one. So I'd like to take a look at some of the alternatives now because we've got so many options out there that a lot of viewers have asked, you know, can we we do a sort of run through what's out there. Um, Starting with the biostimulators, there's better known ones like Sculptra, uh, but we're also hearing now about polynucleotides. So Dr. Emmeline, could you talk us through some of the most popular biostimulators on the market and how they work differently to something like hyaluronic acid? So um, with hyaluronic acid fillers, you kind of get an immediate volumizing effect. Biostimulators are exactly what they sound like. They're stimulatory fillers. So the difference between something like Sculpture versus a hyaluronic acid filler is hyaluronic acid, you get the volumizing effect right away. So you can kind of see the result quite quickly. Whereas the stimulatory fillers, the way that they work is that they're encouraging the body body to build its own collagen. Um, So the idea is that this is potentially, you know, maybe more natural, lasts a little bit longer than a hyaluronic acid filler. Um, But the fillers themselves, they're immunologically inert, and they are causing this foreign body reaction in the tissues to make that collagen. Uh, So really popular ones, really common ones. So Sculpture is a really big one. It's made of something called um, poly L lactic acid. Um, you've got other ones that people might be familiar with. So there's uh, Radius and um, Elonze, and they're, again, very similar. They're within that category of stimulatory or semi-permanent fillers. And then we've got these new products coming out in the market. So the big buzzword in a lot of the aesthetic conferences at the moment is regenerative medicine. Um, and we're looking at things like polynucleotide-based treatments. I'm so, seeing polynucleotides everywhere now. Yeah, I'm wondering what the heck they are. Everywhere. Everyone's asking about them. Um, polynucleotides are just a generic term for nucleic acid compounds, so things like DNA and RNA. Ooh. But recently, we've been looking at what are called polydeoxoribonucleotide um, treatments within aesthetics. And the one thing that I think is important and helpful to mention is, you know, we've been studying polynucleotides since the 1950s, and we've been using them in various aspects of medicine for several decades. Um, So they've been used in things like inflammatory arthritis and tendinopathies and in wound healing. So even though they're a big, big new thing in aesthetics, it's not like there's no research or data behind them. And how are they working then? Are they similar to the biostimulators or? Similar. So they're stimulating our cells on regenerative processes. So again, you know, we're always obsessed with color as aesthetic clinicians. So they are um, stimulating sort of collagen and elastin. Um, Everyone's always very interested in where these polynucleotides are sourced from. Mm. So the ones that we use in aesthetics are naturally sourced from animals. Uh, So salmon or trout sperm is sort of the thing that's been getting all the headlines. Uh, recently. Do I want salmon sperm injected into my face? Ooh. <laughs> I don't know. I would take a beat on that one, I think. Where, um, you know, where people have been finding them really useful is in difficult to treat areas like the under eyes, 
where they're very good at tackling kind of dark circles and wrinkles without that potential difficulty around swelling um, that you can get with hyaluronic acid filler treatments. Um, so really good for delicate areas of the skin. Um, and they're usually recommended that you have, you know, about three treatments, four weeks apart, and then maintain them every six to 12 months. But those are, those are the big, big new thing in aesthetics at the moment. And Dr. Chen, what do you think the pros and cons are there with biostimulator injections? I mean, is there a safety concern there for you with getting salmon sperm injected into your face? <laughs> I'm sure it's not um, pure, you know, it's not salmon sperm as a no. whole. It would extract a fragment. Not come straight from the salmon. <laughs> um, I mean, with, with all these treatments, I'm I'm usually one of the like one of the last people to take on, you know, any new treatment, because I just want to spend enough time to observe and see what's what's happening around me. If there are any, you know, longer term issues, I don't jump at new treatments, because I'm personally very, a very cautious person. And if it's a treatment that I'm not even prepared to have myself, I'm not going to be injecting other people, I don't use my patients as guinea pigs. Um, so I, yeah, so with bar simulators, they have been around for a long time. I've usually been, you know, we've talked about it before in our in our previous mm -hmm. interviews, I've usually been quite slightly against them, mainly because it's, they're very difficult to control in terms of the results, because they are stimulating people's natural response to produce collagen. And that is slightly out of our control It's not a case of what you put in, you get, a, you know, a certain amount of result, you might not put in enough, and they don't see much, and they feel like they've wasted money, or you've put in um, what you feel is the right amount, but they overreact to it and develop a lot of um, collagen and they then become overfilled and then that's something you can't reverse i do appreciate that you know with these things the more you use them the more experienced you become and then you become better at controlling the result mm. it's one of those things where at the moment i'm actually looking into radius as something mm. that i i want to get into and the reason for that um as opposed to um other bar stimulators is because they are slightly different um products and because with collagen um people who don't understand collagen would tend to think all collagen are the same but actually there are different types of collagen and what's really important the, the type of collagen that's that's um that help our skin look healthy and youthful and plump and strong is collagen type three and what a lot of these bar stimulators stimulate is collagen type one which is most of the collagen fibers that we find in scar tissue um, so that that is something that does hold me back quite a bit is that we don't want to be overstimulating collagen one and essentially causing a kind of a scar response um, under the skin. What we want is for that bar stimulator to stimulate natural collagen, collagen three um, and those elastin fibers to give us a more youthful and kind of supple appearance. And some of the studies that I've looked at or speaking to experts that are very experienced at using these things, um, what they've explained to me is that radius is something that forms a scaffold for the fibroblasts, which are the cells that produce collagen and elastin, um, for them to work better. So the collagen produced when they look in the lab is more a lot more collagen type three rather than collagen type one. So that's why I've decided after all these years of looking around waiting, I think Radius would be something that I would look into as, as my product of choice for bar stim stimulators. There's definitely a place for it. It's just about doing it safely. Dr. Emmeline, what do you feel about uh, these biostimulators? Are you adopting any of them? I am starting to adopt polyneuclutides into my clinical practice. Um, like Dr. Chen said, I really agree with her approach about being one of probably the last people to adopt new procedures because you do want to make sure that we've got enough data and that we're able to do these things safely. Um, I think I first started hearing about polynucleotides a couple years ago, and I spoke to um, senior clinicians who I really, really respected um, about them as a treatment. And that was kind of their thought as well. They said, it looks really interesting, looks really promising. You know, the before and after pictures are spectacular, but they always are, aren't they? Um, so let's just, let's just wait and see. Um, but I am starting to use them now in my practice and I'm really um, enjoying having that option for patients and um, I've been seeing really good results so far so I'm quite excited about 
What kind of results have you been seeing? I mean, how does that tie in with the types of collagen that Dr. Chen was talking about there? So where I've been using them primarily is the under eye area because it's such such a difficult area to get right. And it's an area that so many people uh, struggle with and they come and they ask about. And yes, tear trough filler, hyaluronic acid filler can be great, but there people are always surprised there's so so many people where it's just not a suitable treatment in that area and the skin you know the skin in the under eye area is the thinnest most delicate skin of anywhere in our body so we'll have to be really careful that you don't make something look a little bit worse if you're going to give someone a treatment um, and they're coming to you with a potential concern that they have so it's really the under eye area where i've been impressed with the use of polynucleotides filling out that hollowing yeah helping with pigmentation helping with um just the sort of fine lines and wrinkles we also hear about things like uh platelet rich plasma i've heard some doctors saying you know the, the results are kind of yeah and and others are, are more positive about it uh now i'm hearing prf could be a better alternative dr emily what's what's your view on on those because they're they're kind of harnessing our own growth factors within these treatments so i think one of the reasons why a lot of people like prp and a lot of patients feel more comfortable with you know platelet rich plasma is because exactly as you said we're using our own blood our own growth factors so we know that they're quite safe in terms of there's a very minimal risk of an allergic reaction or other complications that would traditionally be associated with injecting a foreign substance into our tissues um just for anyone who's not aware so what we do with platelet-rich plasma is we literally draw blood from the patient and we use a centrifuge to spin it and just divide out the plasma from you know other pieces of the blood so that we get this really nice lovely fluid that's filled with the growth factors and we use that in cosmetic medicine for skin rejuvenation hair growth um, most of the evidence behind PRP has looked at things like wound healing and you know things that like accelerating the healing process um, and again, it's all about that collagen stimulation and production within aesthetics. Um, I have used PRP a little bit in my practice. I'm not using it currently. Um, and I'll speak about PR with F with the caveat that I don't currently use it. So I've very limited, ex well, I've never used it. So I've limited experience with it, but I can kind of present to you at least what the rationale is behind it. Yeah, and how it differs, because we're talking about the difference between uh, plasma and fibrin, I'm going to be honest, I don't understand the difference. What, what, what is it? <laughs> so it's basically, what, what makes it different is it's obtained by using a slower um, centrifuge speed and without anticoagulants in it. Um, so theoretically, the way that it's been presented is that this process leaves you with this fibrin matrix that contains a, a richer concentration of all these growth factors and stem cells um, and that it actually it's creating almost a three-dimensional structure that more closely mimics the wound healing process over, over time. So it's meant to be slightly better than PRP. Um, you don't have you know, the anticoagulants in it that you would with PRP. Um, so maybe that gives it a slight edge mm -hmm. um, so that can give you more pronounced and longer lasting improvements. But this is just the, the way it's presented in the literature. I, I haven't used it myself, so I don't know if Dr. Chan is more experienced with it. Um, I couldn't really say if I have a strong opinion about which is better. Well, I was going to say, I mean, I know you've both been to the Monaco conference recently and so on. I mean, have you seen impressive results shared within these, these gatherings for either PRP or PRF? Personally, I haven't, and, and I um, so PRP is something that I do. I don't currently do PRF, um, and it's one of those new things. Again, I need some time to assess what you know how good the results are. I generally find that with you know with PRP, it's all very well saying let's use our own growth factors, and you know it, it's much safer and so on. But in terms of results. It really depends on the age of the of the patient and what's the quality of their own blood. You know, in someone who's quite young and they have got the good quality growth factors in their blood, then using the PRP to inject back into their, their own skin is going to give them a much better boost than someone who's older and the, the quality of their plasma and the growth factors is much lower. Um, so then the results that you see 
it, it's it's going to be very very limited and then it makes you think what well, is it actually worth doing mm-hmm. so with all these things it's 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 all relative you know and it's um very specific to that particular case that that patient what scenarios do you use it for then dr chen for the, with prp i almost always use it in combination with um microneedling because mm-hmm. It, so the growth factors themselves can support the healing process. But if you just rely on that to rejuvenate the skin, the results are not going to be as good or noticeable. Also, the injections are quite painful as well. So a lot of patients actually can't tolerate the, the injections just with PRP. But in combination with microneedling, we're actually causing controlled injury in the skin. And then that controlled injury then activates a fibroblast to start healing and to start producing more collagen, uh, more elastin, more hyaluronic acid. And actually it's during that recovery phase that having the, the PRP can really help speed up that recovery process, reduce the downtime. Um, so I've always found that the combination of PRP and microneedling gives much better results and generally less downtime than someone just having one or the other. There was another one I wanted to ask you about, Dr. Chen, which is Profilo, Profilo? Profilo, yes. Profilo. Um, I mean, I understand it's also a hyaluronic acid filler, but it's used slightly differently. What is the difference between using Profilo and a traditional hyaluronic acid filler? Mm. So Profilo is pure non-cross-linked hyaluronic acid. So that means that the hyaluronic acid molecules are not linked up to each other. So they're they're kind of, um, they're smaller molecules than what you would find in a normal um, dermal filler that we would use to volumize the face. So even though it's hyaluronic acid, it's not, it's sort of classed with the skin boosters rather than um, dermal fillers. Mm. Um, and the reason for that is that the injection technique actually involves quite super, fairly superficial um, injections of Profilo in set points in the face and neck. Um, I've also used it on the back of the hand to rejuvenate the skin. So the, the, the purpose of it is mainly for skin rejuvenation and again, just kind of stimulate, it, it um, helps with hydrating the skin from underneath um from within and also stimulating some of the collagen production as well so mm. it's really great for for skin that has become more dry and thin and crepey um, and it can just give the it can help boost the skin um skin quality improve the skin give it a little bit of plumpness a little bit of a glow exactly and okay. and then as a result of that a little bit of a um kind of tightening a little bit of a lift as well another one i wanted to ask about was Microtox. Saw it recently on Instagram. Um, it seems to be the new kid in town. So, you know, Dr. Emmeline, have you heard of that one? Can you tell us what it is and what its benefits are? So I first encountered um, the concept of Microtox in 2020. There was a paper that was published in the Journal of Plastic and Reconstructive Surgery. Um, really small study, small sample size, but quite positive results. And basically they were looking at this new way of injecting Botox. So it involves using a very diluted form of botulinum toxin and injecting it really, really superficially into the skin. So rather than targeting the deeper muscle layers, as you would with traditional toxin, you know, where you're trying to smooth out the muscles and reduce movement, um, you're targeting the really superficial muscle fibers that connect to the dermis and you're injecting hundreds of tiny, tiny, tiny little droplets of toxin into the skin. And the concept behind it is that by treating these superficial fibers, you're theoretically reducing a bit of the pulling and tethering effects on the skin from these fibers, which um, again, theoretically will make pores appear a little bit smaller, reduce excessive sweating um, without under, uh, affecting the underlying muscle dynamics. So for people who you know want to keep full expression and natural movement in their faces, but would like to get really um, smooth, clear, lustrous skin. So it is being marketed now as sort of the glass skin facial. Um, So again, more focusing on skin quality um, and texture and radiance rather than looking at treating um, obvious dynamic wrinkles, which is how we traditionally use Botox. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, because for a minute I was thinking, oh, could you just get, you know, could you just get superficial lines kind of blurred out with this stuff, but it's it's not quite as helpful as that. Um, have you seen, have either of you seen results from Microtox? 
I've only seen them in papers. I've not, so again, this isn't a treatment I'm doing myself at the moment. Um, it's only before and afters that I've seen published in the literature. I do know there are some big clinics in London that are starting to offer this. Um, again, it's one of those things where this is still a very new treatment. The studies are still very, very small. And I think if someone really, really wants to focus on improving their skin quality and skin health in general, we have lots of very effective things in our toolkits that you know we've used for a long time to get them there without jumping to, a, I think it's like a 500 plus pound facial treatment. So I'm not, I'm not doing it yet. Not to say I never would do it in the future, yeah. but at the moment it's not something I'm offering. So, I mean, it sounds like uh, with everything we've, we've gone over today that both of you, for both of you, hyaluronic acid filler is probably still your number one choice for a skin volumizer, is, is that correct? So in terms of um, volumizing the face, um, definitely my first choice would be hyaluronic acid um, for boosting skin quality, um, I would probably look at combination of um, something like Profilo as a, as a skin booster um, or potentially Ray S for, for some more superficial areas that I do want to kind of boost a bit of volume in but don't want to put filler in um, because sometimes the um, hyaluronic acid filler can make the tissues more more stiff. Um, there's some areas that it's very difficult to volumize with, with a um, filler. So yeah, so I'm looking at, so HA for deeper areas and then the more super, superficial areas, either something like Radius or Profilo for the skin. Okay, and Dr. Emily? So for volumizing or adding structure to the face, hyaluronic acid fillers, definitely um, big Profilo girls. So as a skin booster, Profilo, and then I am adding polynucleotides into my practice now. Um, can I just add a little bit about the microtox? So you've yes. I I've kind of, um, so I've never advertised my, uh, microtox, but I have um, been sometimes adding a little bit of toxin to the mesotherapy that I do um, for those, because I, you know, at this Chinese clinic, a lot of the clients, they complain of large pores. That's one of the main concerns. Um, and so for those clients, then we do sometimes add in a little bit of toxin in the mesotherapy. And what do you do for the mesotherapy? So mesotherapy, essentially like what um, Dr. Emily, uh, Emily said, uh, lots of tiny injections in the skin. That's essentially what mesotherapy is. It's injecting a combination of hyaluronic acid and, and various vitamins, growth factors, um, whatever the product you choose to inject, mm -hmm. lots of tiny injections into the skin to help boost mainly hydration um, and to stimulate skin rejuvenation. And you're seeing good results from that? We must be. I mean, for me, it's it's difficult to see the result. Um, I think in photographs, it's difficult to see, to have that direct comparison. But those clients that keep on coming back for the treatment, so it must be effective. Um, but also another thing, so I've actually heard of um, this particular use of toxins quite a few years back, um, pre uh, COVID, quite a few years back in a conference where they were talking about using dilute toxins um, in the superficial injection pattern to treat people with severe acne mm -hmm. so that is something that i have uh, tried a few times but i always combine combine the treatment with um good medical grade skincare products mm -hmm. as well and i think long term the right skincare products is the most important um but for those people who are are just very, have very oily skin, then this is a potential treatment that can help reduce the oil production in those people. Mm. For the pore size, it's more subjective. Um, so I probably wouldn't be charging like 500 pounds for microtox, mm -hmm. but it will be an add-on that I would offer um, as part of my mesotherapy treatments. Excellent. Oh, that was really clear. Uh, thank you. I feel like I've learned a lot uh, from both of you as always. So thank you for your time. I'm looking forward to the next one already. Thank you. Same. Thank you for organizing this. So what do you think after hearing this discussion? Are you considering any of these filler treatments or have you tried them in the past? I'd love to hear your experiences and opinions. I've included social media links for both Dr. Emmeline and Dr. Chen in the video description so you can give them a follow, along with links to some of our other discussions, which you might also enjoy. And you'll find more advice and information around healthy aging 
on my website, honest.scot. And if you scroll down to the bottom of any page, you can sign up to my monthly newsletter in which I round up some of my best content from the previous month and bring you up to speed with all the latest news from the Honest channel. And if you haven't already, then by hitting subscribe, you won't miss future videos from me. But for now, thanks for being here today.